And good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. And uh, welcome to our Friday webinar from a, shall I say, indifferently unpleasant but sunny day in Pittsburgh. I always give you the weather forecast because it changes hourly. Um, but it's quite pleasant today and I hope it is where you are and I hope you're all warm and cozy and do say hi when you come on and join us. It's nice to know that you're out there. Um, and for those of you who are watching it this evening or some other evening on the YouTube channel, you can't say hi. You should have been here now. James, welcome. Always an early visitor. And Greg, near Carnegie. And James, the other, uh, over in Crafton. Hi, James. Nice to see you. Grace, ever reliable from Dublin. Welcome. Shelley, Mount Lebanon, the other side of town. There's Fitz Jamie. Hello. For anybody who's wondering, that's not Fitz Jamie jumping in the picture. It's Fred Astaire, but he has dreams. So that's today. We're going to be talking about Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Paycock with my very special guest. That is uh, Director Joe Dowling, who I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment for those of you who don't know. And if you don't know, you really are not in the theatre. Um, as usual, I want to say thank you to the Allegheny Foundation for their very generous sponsorship of these webinars, making it possible for us to do it at no cost to you, uh, which is why, of course, the webinars are always free. However, uh, you can, and I actively encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, because on that, you not only get the webinars, all the webinars going back, I think this is our 59th now. And uh, you'll also find out various alerts about what we're doing and what we're up to, as you will on our Facebook page and other um, social media outlets. So just, you can't escape us. We're out there. Tune in to us and you'll find out all about what we're up to. And of course, as usual, even though the webinars are free and always will be, we would love you to make a donation. And you can do that. Go to our website, www.pictheatre.org. Note that there are two T's. And um, please, please, please consider a donation. And as I always say, every donation, no matter how small, matters. It all helps. And an important thing to remember, your donations, donations from, from you know, private donors, people like yourselves, all that money goes towards production. You don't spend your money, your donations on administration and buying envelopes and paying for postage stamps. We get the money from the foundations to do that. Your donations, you are directly supporting the, the theatre we do. You're directly supporting the artists. So every dollar counts. No matter how small, every single dollar matters. And no matter how small the donation, all donations, like the faucet, will eventually fill the sink. So please consider. Hello, David. Warm and mellow evening there in the, the, the real Stratford. Uh, lovely to see you. Welcome back. Dennis, um, you'll have... Oh, dear. Well, it's nice that you saw say hello. And uh, thank you for joining us. And you'll catch it this evening. I know you will. Um, but it's good, to, it's good that you, uh, you make the effort. I love that. People making the effort. It's wonderful. Uh, it's two o'clock now. As usual, we'll wait two or three minutes for people waiting, trying to park uh, and find their seats. And um, and then we'll we'll make a start. But anyway, uh, a couple of other tiny little things uh, before we begin. Um, as you may imagine, we're rapidly approaching the start of the, uh, the, the next season. And as you know, because I keep telling you, it is our 25th anniversary season. Um, we're going to announce the, uh, the season on the 8th of September, which is only about a week or so away. Um, and on that day, we'll also be live streaming all the information about the season, about tickets, about, you know, when you can come and how you come and all the rest of it. And um, if you want to get a, a detailed pack from us about the season and, and you're, you're worried that you're not on our mailing list, just send an email to marketing at pictheatre.org and we will get a pack to you. Um, any, any questions, any comments, any inquiries, that's the email, marketing at pictheatre.org. And uh, as I say, you want information? We will give you information. 
one other tiny thing before we begin. The city paper of Pittsburgh, of glorious renown, is running its best of, as usual. And we have uh, reached the final 10 in three categories uh, for the arts. Um, we've been nominated for Best Virtual Performance, which was our radio presentation of Christmas Carol. We've been nominated as Best Theatre, which of course we are. And we've been nominated for Best Virtual Literary. And that's for these webinars, which you are regulars on. So please, please, please consider, if you can, go to the City Paper website. You'll find the connection and vote for us because not, it's being in the top 10 of each category is really nice. Winning it is nicer. So please, please consider that. Okay. So we'll assume the latecomers have parked their cars and have arrived. And uh, we are going to talk today about what I think is one of the finest, if not, yeah, it's certainly one of the finest plays of the 20th century. It's a remarkable piece of theater. I think it's one of the finest plays of any century. But um, to talk about it, um, I'm, uh, I'm bringing somebody who knows infinitely more about it than I do. Uh, the play is Sean O'Casey's Juno and the Paycock. Um, it's part of Sean O'Casey's um, trilogy, possibly quartet of plays on set on and around that period in Irish history of um, the, the, the striving for independence around the Easter uprising before, during, and after. And the one person in the world I know who knows infinitely more about it than I do is my old friend Joe Dowling from Dublin. Uh, Joe, who was uh, for many years artistic director of the Guthrie Theatre in Minneapolis. Before that, he was the artistic director of the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. Before that, he was the artistic director of uh, the Irish Theatre Company, the Irish, Ireland's National Touring Theatre. He also directed, like myself, at the, and acted at the Gate Theatre. Uh, in fact, we did act together once. I think he remembers. Um, so let me introduce you, Joe Dowling. And welcome. And Joe, you're mute. <laughs> Uh, can he unmute himself? I'm no, can't hear you, Joe. You're still mute. Where's his mute button? It's a, on. It's on the banner at the very bottom of the screen. There, ah, there you are. There you uh, are. I, I told you I was a luddite, and I am. <laughs> Proudly, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you were never—you were never a sound guy. Um, no, 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 no. Not in any sense. But. <laughs> welcome to the Pit webinar. So, Joe, as I uh, said of you, uh, I can't imagine anybody else who knows more particularly about this play uh, than you do. Um, t tell us a word or two about O'Casey and his. His sort of position in, in, in Irish literature and Irish drama? Well, he was born in um, 1880s, so he grew up, uh, uh, I mean, he was almost 21 before the, uh, the Abbey came into existence, so he would have been aware of it uh, from a very early age. Um, but he, his, his, Contributions to the Abbey really started uh, with a play called Nanny's Night Out, uh, which is a terrible play. Um, but the Abbey, uh, Lady Gregory, who was the founder of the Abbey along with Yeats, um, was very interested in him as a playwright. And then the very first play he wrote and was presented at the Abbey uh, was The Shadow of a Gunman, which was set during the War of Independence. That was That was done... Um, at, at the Abbey in, in, in 1923. Um, and it was telling of a time in Irish politics when the country was uh, still under British rule. And in fact, the British had sent in an auxiliary force called the Black and Tans um, to quell the, 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 the War of Independence. And it's set in a Dublin tenement. Um, and it, 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 the, when you think about the, the War of Independence 
ended in 1921 with the treaty. Um, so he was writing very soon after, he was writing about events that had occurred and, and writing them for and about the people to whom these had occurred. He, he, he was able um, to translate his own experiences and the experiences of people around him into what is still seen as, uh, you, you call it a, a trilogy, and it's, that was the first of the, the trilogy, even though in terms of the uh, chronology, it wasn't the first of the events. Um, so th suddenly, I mean, the Abbey had, had a, a remarkable start with John Millington Singh and Playboy of the Western World and Riders to the Sea and all of those great, great poetic plays. And then it went through a period of rather dull um, uh, sort of rural farmhouse dramas. And suddenly came this urban voice, um, a Dubliner, uh, uh, Sean O'Casey. Um, and, and it was a voice that hadn't been heard on the Irish stage before at any point. So uh, suddenly um, O'Casey was, was kind of the savior of the Abbey because his play, The, the Shadow of a Gunman, um, did so well. And then they encouraged him to, to write another one. And that's when he wrote Juno and the Paycock. Um, and the third of the trilogy was Plow and the Stars, which of course is about the 1916 rising set during that week. Um, and, and before we get on to Juno, it's just worth noting that 10 years after the Easter rising, which is a, an, a, an absolutely seminal event in Irish political life. Um, 10 years afterwards, Sean O'Casey wrote a play that was highly critical of the nationalist leaders who, who went out to fight in Easter week. He saw them as vainglorious, he saw them as um, being egotistical, and that in fact, they weren't concerned about the peoples as much as they were about their own reputation. And, and that was an extraordinary thing for a playwright to do, and an extraordinary thing for the Abbey Theatre, founded to elevate the idea of Irishness, founded to have people think that the Irish weren't um, an, a, a non-manageable um, group of savages, which is how they were being presented throughout the 19th century by playwrights and by cartoonists and so on. And so the idea that Yeats um, would present that play um, 10 years after the rising and have, as we know, the opening night was a couple of nights were disrupted by rioters, people who felt that that the uh, that our, our Irish um, nationalism was being attacked in a very uh, overt way, which it was. Um, so, O'Casey, okay, that whole period from the, the first play in 1923 through to 1926, he dominated Irish theatre. He dominated the Abbey, and he used, his plays were the ones that people would line up around the, the block to see. Um, and it, then, it, it, yeah, sorry. Sorry, no, I was going to say, it, what, what was what always strikes me about those plays, because they are pinpoint uh, accounts of particular moments in what we call that the struggle from, from the Easter Rising through the War of Independence and Juno set in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, but he doesn't write it with major players as the central characters. He writes it as it's as those events affect the ordinary plain people of Dublin, which is exactly. what makes them so remarkable because they they deal in history with, as as you point out, remarkable degree of truth. Yeah, but the, but yet, they, they they deal in a very recent history. I mean, yeah. they're, they're not his, They weren't history plays. They are now because we look back on that period. Um, though I, I know that when when we get on to talking about the productions I've done of it, um, the, the plays were extraordinarily relevant right through the Troubles, right through the whole of what was happening in, in Northern Ireland. But where I was going to go with this is that O'Casey's, um, he, he saved the Abbey, no question. The Abbey, uh, the, 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 they'd lost the money from Miss Horniman, they'd lost, um, and they the, 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 these plays that O'Casey wrote, um, kept them alive. And yet, when he wrote a much more, um, in, in a way, a much more savage play called The Silver Tassie, which he wrote in, uh, and, and presented to the Abbey for presentation, Yeats rejected that play. And O'Casey um, 
they eventually did it, but O'Casey was soured on the Abbey almost immediately um, and, and took himself to London and finally to, uh, to Devon and really had very little to do with Irish theatre after that. Mm -hmm. And his later plays, which, which uh, to some extent, they, they've been kind of, you know, re re they're regarded as a bit like the Tennessee Williams very late plays. They're regarded as unstageable, but they're not. They're a very interesting attempt by a playwright who was steeped in naturalism in the early work to actually expand and explore and, and, and do various different things. So Irish theatre let him down very badly um, by, by not accepting that a writer cannot stay fixed within the genre that they've begun. They have to expand and explore. Right. We've yeah. seen that with so many writers all around the world. And O'Casey was told by the Abbey, no, you must continue to write these kind of plays because that's all, I'm, I'm exaggerating that. Um, but, but in my view, having studied it fairly closely, I think Yeats was just incredibly jealous because Yeats was the greatest poet the Irish in, 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 in certainly until Heaney, he was the greatest poet that Ireland had, but he was a terrible playwright. I mean, it yes. has to be said. He did yes. write unstageable plays. One day, one day we must do a webinar on the topic of Yeats's very bad drama. But um, <laughs> I'll get you to join me for that too. So look, come to come to um to Juno, which yeah. as I said in my preamble, I think is one of the great plays of all time. It's not just one of the great plays of the 20th century. Um, to me, I'm, I'm a, I, I find it utterly appealing because it has all the elements of, of Greek tragedy. It's, all the elements are there, uh, except that the tragic hero is, is the, the woman, um, uh, is Juno herself. Um, and, and because of that, and because of she becomes the victim of circumstance, almost as if she were cursed by the gods. Um, it, 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 she becomes phenomenally appealing as a character and and one feels such an overwhelming sense of doom and tragedy on everything around her, no matter how funny the play gets, and it does. So what attracts you so much? Because I know, I mean, we talked about this, I think you've probably directed this play more than anybody living. Um, what attracts you so much to it in particular? Well, I think that there there are many elements to it, and you're quite right about Juno being a, a, a you know even the name suggests a kind of a link with with Greek tragedy. Um, but you see, Sean O'Casey was a socialist all his life. He he believed very strongly in the idea of um, socialism and the, uh, the the breaking down the those. Uh, barriers and and creating an opportunity for people to see um, a different world, people born into in difficult economic circumstances. So when he wrote Juno and the Paycock, it was, as I say, it was shortly after he wrote about the Civil War, um, almost six months after the war had ended. That's how close it was to the time. And again, in that play, he um, questions the motives of those who, who fought brother against brother, father against son, and, and created what, what has remained or, or until very recently, the, the way in which politics uh, works in Ireland, worked in Ireland with the different political parties based on their support uh, 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 for, for uh, one side or the other in the, in, the, in the Civil War. But at the fundamentally, at the core of the play, the Civil War is vitally important and people have to understand the, what is the difference between the Irregulars and the, and the IRA and all of that. But at the core of this play, there is intense poverty. At the time he wrote the play, there was a, a, a great, the, the, a higher level of infant mortality in Dublin than there was in Calcutta. There was a level of poverty in one of the cities of uh, what was then the British Empire um, that was literally where uh, a, a large portion of the, particularly in the inner, inner city of Dublin, and it was true of Limerick, it was true of Cork, it was true all throughout the country. The, the tenements there were um, truly appalling, absolutely appalling, and people were 
um, dying of, of various diseases that could have been and should have been cured. So O'Casey wasn't just writing about the conflict in that bigger sense. He was writing about the individuals, about how the, the, the poverty was affecting those people. And you have this character of Juno, as you say, uh, but uh, uh, as well as the kind of um, metaphorical uh, aspects of her, she's a very ordinary Dublin woman. She goes out in the morning to clean other people's houses. She comes home to look after her own family. She's constantly trying to make ends meet, constantly trying to find enough money to just carry on, to survive. And her husband, uh, Captain Boyle, now he's not really a captain, that he just got that name, uh, as, as happens often in Dublin, people get nicknames. Um, and he got it because he once went on a boat to Liverpool. And he talked about going on that boat as if, in fact, he had uh, gone around the world in 80 days. But he, um, it, it, when I started to examine the play and work and work on it, which I did indeed in, in a production that you were in, Alan. Um, I was indeed. You played the, the mobilizer. You, you I called the music indeed. to order, as you're so now still doing, but you're doing it now in a much more uh, <laughs> effective way. Um, but... When I started to examine that play, what I realized was that while Captain Boyle and Jocks are daily, these two um, figures of, of Dublin um, manhood, <laughs> while they were, as far as the Abbey was concerned, in any production I ever saw there, or indeed directed there, they were seen as figures of fun, comedy figures, sitting down, having the, the, eating the sausage, and, and Juno coming home early, and Jocks are having to jump out the window, all of that um, farce and music hall kind of humor was very much in O'Casey's blood because he grew up take, being taken to the music hall, which was the kind of the, the, the ordinary people's theater in the in, in, in back in the late eighty in the late nineteenth um, century and, and and early twentieth century. But at the core, those two characters are lost human beings. Joxer, a man who's able to quote literature, able to quote the, uh, the classics, able to quote scripture, clearly is a man who's had an education somewhere along the line, but who has been literally reduced to a tramp. And Captain Boyle, who complains of the pains in his legs. And when I started to work on the play, what I started to examine was what is the impact of long-term unemployment? How, how does it affect people? And one of the things that happens when people are un unemployed, as he would have been for years, because the le also, as well as the in intense poverty in Dublin at the time, um, there also was a, I mean, people actually um, w went into the to the army in the First World War, in, as, as, as many young people do, in order to earn a living, because there was, there was nothing um, available to, to them. Um, except manual labor and that was where someone when when captain boyle got to the age that he was he is he's a middle aged to to older man um and hadn't worked for years the impact was uh, 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 again to various psychologists have talked about it the impact is that they can't work it's yeah. not possible any longer for them to work so we started i started thinking of this play not as a uh, a sort of a record of the civil war, but as an examination from a socialist perspective, because that's what he was, of how you deal with um, long-term unemployment, with poverty, um, with with degradation, as as that happened, and of course you have the Johnny Boyle uh, plot, which is about the civil war and his betrayal of of um, his 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 neighbour, um, Robbie Tancred. That's a, so these two plots run side by side. And if you ignore one, which a lot of productions, um, had certainly in the Abbey, had done, yeah. and you emphasize the other, you, you distort O'Casey's intention. His intention... Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, just, it, it, can I jump in on the Johnny story, uh, Johnny Boyle story? He was, he, he was wounded during the Civil War. Um, we discovered he betrayed his friend. Sorry, he was, he was wounded during the War of Independence. I'm sorry, the War of Independence, yeah. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Um, he, we know that we discover that he betrayed his friend and he's going to pay for it. Um, but what he represents 
is another thing. As you say, the, the, the captain and jocks are represent what long-term unemployment does. And Juno represents what incredible poverty can do to a family. Johnny represents something really rather interesting, which is fear. That what fear can do to a human being, because that's what he lives in. He lives in a perpetual state of fear. And it's fascinating. I, one of the things about the play that fascinates me is that O'Casey, in, in the space of a couple of hours, brings in so many themes. And I, I utterly agree with you. You cannot ignore the themes, any of the themes. You've got to recognize all of it because it is so beautifully constructed and, and, and so cohesive in terms of those themes. But the yeah. Johnny Boyle theme of, of fear, um, it's so beautifully drawn. Does that come from O'Casey's own, because he did have a background with the with the uh, Irish Republican Brotherhood? Which, which he left um, when, when yeah. it became clear that they were going to join with the, with the um, uh, you know, joining the in the in the Easter Rising, he 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 then became part of the the Citizens Army. Um, though he did not fight in in he didn't go out in in, in 1916. And many people who um, subsequently sort of ridiculed him and said he had no right to write about that period because he actually had been um, unwilling to, to to take part in the Rising. Um, he had very very strong reservations about Irish nationalism and the way in which it was unfolding. Um, Johnny's Johnny. Um, th 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 what's really fascinating about Johnny is that he's this mixture of a young man who's wounded. I mean, uh, uh, he, he, he lost his arm. I mean, he's a very troubled, difficult um, life he's had. Um, but the whole sort of uh, the, the Catholicism is at such a, a center of that. Of that world, and Johnny um, strongly believes. I mean, he 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 um, he, he sees the, the 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 light that's coming from the the um, perpetual statue that 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 Juno has there. He sees that. He sees ghosts in that. He sees Robbie Tancred in that. And yet, he constantly um, goes back to that religion, um, which you know um, is a, really interesting because O'Casey. Okay, was uh, was from a Protestant family. Casey yes. wasn't Catholic. He was Protestant, and in fact, the, the, the there was no. He was he was when he was born, uh, he was christened John Casey. Um, he wasn't Sean O'Casey or Sean O'Cahazig as he. Uh, so he he, he um, didn't grow up in that Catholic tradition, and yet he has. You're right about the fear, but he has the other side of Johnny is this belief that he will be saved. You know, um, um, by the divine intervention, and of course that proves not to be the case but you know the, the other thing that's fantastic about the play is that plot because you start off with this scene uh with mary reading the newspaper and start on a little by road out beyond fingless he was found talking about um robbie tancred um and juno comes in and the, her, the, the father is obviously out drinking. It's early. It's in the morning, so you're you're immediately into domestic situation, a domestic, and you're and 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 if you're sort of, um, you know, aware of late nineteenth century plays, Galsworthy, others, you're thinking, oh, we're going to have a family situation now, and 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 suddenly, what happens is Mary brings home a savior. A man who's going to rescue them, who's going to make them rich, and this is uh, Mr. Bentham, and he tells them of a, a will, a, a, of a distant relative, and the the will has the the estate has been left to the to, to to Jack Boyle to the father, and suddenly the play takes on a whole different. Feeling. I mean, Juno even, her shoulders go down, she relaxes. At the end of the act of Act One, um, she and the captain are dancing around, singing, Oh, me darling, you know, I will be true to thee. I won't sing it, I can't. Um, but the, 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 good. <laughs> the play, the, so you end Act One with hope. Fantastic. They're going, these, this is about a family who are going to survive all the rigors that they've been through. And Act Two, of course, is a glorious 
glorious scene where the, the neighbors, Mrs. Maisie Madigan and Jocks, are come for the party because, of course, these are they're going, these people are going to have um, so much money. And that ends rather sort of sadly with the with the arrival of Mrs. Tancred, the widow or the the mother of the uh, of the of the slain man. Um, but O'Casey is setting us up in those two acts. It's it's this fantastic rise to a place where we simply don't know at the end of Act Two what's going to happen, mm -hmm. because there are hints that maybe this legacy is not entirely what it should be. And then comes, I think, an act, the third act of the play, I think is on a level with, uh, it's, it's, it's a Shakespearean act. That's an act where it, it, things are stripped away, literally. Um, the, the furniture is removed. Finally, the, you end up on a bare stage with two men, um, the, a, a very rattled old Lear <laughs> and, his, and his clown. And that... Uh, and that sense of O'Casey writing, uh, you could see in that last act that he was writing, he, that he was sp spreading his wings as a writer. And then, of course, comes his masterpiece, um, Plow in the Stars. So yeah. what I'm saying is that, 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 that there are so many, you're quite right, there are so many different themes and ideas. But theatrically, this piece works if you actually listen to what O'Casey is saying, as opposed yeah. to what has happened with a lot of the Abbey productions, again, going back to 1964 and 1979, the one I directed at the Abbey, um, always played as though, in fact, th th these um, these were good people who'd fallen on hard times, as opposed to uh, products of a system that's, uh, that, that drove them into poverty and despair. Yeah. Um, do, do, do let me jump back for a second, because because uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that you used the, the, the holy name of Shakespeare for that last act, because I agree, it is Shakespearean in its scope and in its, its size. And something you mentioned much earlier, uh, which comes to Mrs. Tancred's character, um, this notion of, you know, fathers and, and sons and brothers and cousins killing one another in a civil war, which is true of any civil war. Uh, it reminds me always of the, the uh, is in Henry VI, I can't remember which part, where the king is looking at the father who killed his son and the son who killed his father. And Mrs. Tancred's speech uh, at the end of Act Two really is the, the cry of the, mo the mother over the futility and stupidity of what a civil war can do. Yeah. Um, which O'Casey does a very strange thing. He repeats it in the mouth of another woman later in the play. He gives that yeah. same speech to yeah. Juno. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's a really it, it's it's a remarkably potent moment of theatre. It, it it is because because of where it comes again. You see, um, uh, uh, Lady Gregory has a lot of uh, O'Casey had a lot to thank Lady Gregory for, because what uh, in O'Casey's early drafts. Um, Act two was divided into two, uh, Act three rather, was divided into two scenes. And one was in the, the, at, the, at the arrival of the, of the mobilizer and the, the irregulars to, to take Johnny out. And then he moved the action to the side of the mountain where Johnny was shot. And he was, he was obviously so influenced by the kind of busico, the melodrama, that, that he felt he needed to show the audience. And it was Lady Gregory who said, you don't need that, and, and, and made him rewrite Act Three um, into this, what, what we both described as a kind of a, 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 a classic form that, that really does make you think of, of, of Shakespeare and, and great uh, tragic writers. Um, Mrs. Tancred, you see, th where that scene comes, and again, I think it goes back to, to uh, his skill as a playwright. Um, they've been just singing, the, the, the gramophone that they've bought is put on, and it's it, it, the, the song they play is, If you're Irish, come into the parlor, and they all dance around to, If you're Irish, come into the parlor. There's a welcome there for you. And then they hear the funeral going, the 
coffin had been brought down the stairs um, outside their room and they opened the door and there's Ireland. There's the welcome that is for, for, for being Irish. A, a boy riddled with bullets, as his mother says, left on the, you know, out, a little by road out beyond Finglas, he was found. Um, and suddenly the play just crystallizes into the into the um, uh, that that thing you've talked about, brother and fighting brother, neighbor betraying neighbor. Mm. This is a boy that Johnny grew up with that lived in the house, and the end of Act Two, we, we the the whole party it's like just turns to ashes. There's no you 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 look at the house they've decorated. They have. Uh, bunting up and they've decorated it and they've bought beautiful bright clean furniture and were brought right back into the yeah. poverty it, the desolation. It's, one of those, it's one of those rare and beautiful moments of theater where and i know from having seen and i've seen several of your productions i was in one but uh where the you literally go cold the mrs tangred's moment literally makes you go cold you the the appallingness of it mm. because you know it's that this is truth being spoken mm. uh, and it's a glorious moment of theater the only other i should just one tiny side one i mentioned uh, as you mentioned i played the mobilizer for you in i think it was your first production and i know second, second one that were in the height of, of 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 our time with the troubles in ireland uh, and what was going on in the north uh, that the arrival of the mobilizer really did have a, a, a strange effect, um, and it was perfectly fine when we were as we were touring the country with it. But it was it was interesting. But I do know that when we were playing Belfast in the Arts mm -hmm. Theatre, when that door opened and I walked onto the stage, I've never achieved silence like mm -hmm. it. Um, and it, it dawned on me on that the first performance in Belfast. Everybody in the audience dreaded what I was representing. Yep. Uh, it yep. was a very extra. And again, the, the fact that the play, uh, which, as you say, was written as a very modern piece and a very immediate piece in response to circumstances at the time, still had that potency yeah. once you put it into the context in which it was written. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're quite right, because certainly um, when we did that production in Belfast, there was. It was at the height of the troubles, yeah. And um, you, you couldn't, you couldn't but be linked to what had happened in Bally Murphy and what had happened yeah. in Falls Road and what had happened in, in, in the bog side. You couldn't but see families that were destroyed um, by by the violence that was occurring and and the and the official reaction to that violence. Uh, all of that, is, uh, O'Casey speaks to in 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 the play. Um, in a way that's that that really, you know, when when I did the show, when I did the the, the production for the Gate Theatre, which was the one that ultimately went around the world and and became a very famous production, um, we toured it uh, to Jerusalem. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to go because I was directing something else. So the cast and the and, and the assistant director took it to to Jerusalem. And everybody that was there said that they met there in in in, in uh, Israel said um, this play could be written about here. It could be written about now. Yeah. It's exactly it has exactly the same uh, ramifications in in a place where um, where there is that kind of division and that kind of of uh, tension and 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 ultimately violence. Um, so you, you know, gr great plays don't just exist within their own time. They're, they right. they they survive because they speak to eternal truths. And That's where the point. I mean, I always describe. I mean, people say our title, classic theatre. Classic theatre is true of its time and for all time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and certainly, I'm glad you mentioned that Jerusalem one because I remember talking to some of the actors when they uh, when they were back from that and saying it was a really strange experience and i thought it was as strange an experience as i had in your earlier production um uh, in belfast yeah. um, and i think it would be true if you were 
if somebody decides to put it on in Kabul in the next period, I think everybody will recognize it. Not that they're yeah. likely to. Yeah. Yeah, no, they're not likely to do that. I don't either. think so. Um, he does do that thing in the play that makes great tragedy great, which is, and you mentioned it somewhat in, in Act Two, uh, the introduction of comedy for comedy, almost almost for comedy's sake. And yet the characters are so, I mean, Maisie Madigan is one of those glorious Dublin characters um, that, that is almost eternal. But he, or, and it is, a, is it, would you agree? Uh, it is using comedy to all, it's almost a sleight of hand to, to lull well, us in a false sense of. Yeah, uh, I, uh, but he was a great comic writer as well. Okay. I mean, there, there are sequences in all three of the plays that, that, that we're talking about, the, the trilogy, um, which are literally kind of like music hall sketches. That was his tradition. That's where he grew up. He grew up watching Busico. He grew up watching melodrama. He grew up also because Dublin was a very strong, had a very strong musical tradition back in the early, in the late 1900s and the early 20th century. He was, he was steeped in that. So that was how, and in some of his short one act plays, they're, they're pure musical sketches, um, bedtime story, um, you know, some of those, those ones uh, that, that he wrote. So he, he sort of inserted it both, as you say, as a sort of, um, because he knew later on, this is going to be very tragic. So we, we all need to laugh and those people needed to laugh. So the idea of that party was both to show the captain at his most expansive and his most welcoming and his most generous and, um, uh, the, the fact that he was able to sort of say, sit down there, jocks, or have a drink, and, and Maisie Maddock invite, because Juno wouldn't have those people in the house at all. They were, they were the, the, the dregs of society, the yeah. Juno, the jocksers, and Maisie Maddock. When she turns on the police at the end of Act 3 and screams down the stairs at them, you see the sort of fishwife she actually is. Now, she's a wonderfully drawn character, Leo Casey, but she would never have been a friend of Juno's. Juno would not want her in the house no. at all. So the captain has taken charge. I'm inviting my people to my home. Suddenly, having been terrified of Juno in Act One, he's in command. And Juno is thrilled. She sits back going, this is what I've always wanted. She never wanted to be the termagant who, who made life misery for her husband and her, her children. She, but, and of course then that makes the tragedy of Juno, which you described so brilliantly at the beginning, the tragedy all the greater. When, yeah. when Mary, when Mary um, comes back and it's clear that Bentham has made her pregnant, uh, has got her pregnant, uh, and the father uh, go, goes to beat her, and Juno has to stop him. And then he goes out saying, you know, you better not be here when I get back or I, I, I won't be accountable for my actions. And Juno knows at that moment that the father will do her terrible damage. He's, he's, he's such a wounded man at that stage. And her decision to leave him and to, to, to close the door, drawn uh, again, okay, see, he, he, he was like any good writer, he was a magpie. He took from wherever he could find it. And, and Ibsen's Nora um, yeah. was where, where he went there. And her final speech where she repeats Mrs. Tancred, that not only is a great moment that, you know, a, sort of a great aria in the play, it also links her now with the mothers of those who have fallen on both sides. Yeah. And, and, and as she walks out that door, we know she will never come back. Um, she and Mary will make a home for themselves somewhere else, and the captain is completely on his own now. It's, it's stunning writing when you think oh, about it's it. Brilliant. I, it. There's a thing there that in in his in the plays because you mentioned when when Plough and the Stars came to the stage, there were riots. Um, there was disgust yeah. at the fact that that a lady of the night was represented on the mm. stage, Rosie Redmond. Mm. Um, just like in Sing's Playboy of the Western World, because there were young ladies in men, the mention of young ladies in their shifts or underwear. Um, it was still, you know, old fashioned, good, very Catholic conservatism abroad. But the fact that into this play he introduces illegitimacy, a girl getting pregnant, 
that in itself was, dare I say, risque at the time, was it not? Oh, it, 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 it had been hinted at in plays, um, mm. but to actually bring it on, when, when Juno comes back from the doctor and says, um, you know, is it consumption? Uh, the, the captain says, because that, of course, consumption was what took away so many people and yeah. uh, um, TB. Um, and she says, he, he says, what's wrong with Mary? Is it consumption? And Juno says, it's worse. And I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about yeah. the, the, the social order and how they, it's worse than consumption. Consumption kills people by the thousands, yeah. by the millions. <laughs> Having a baby was worse because of what would, would and, um, and, and then she says, Mary's going to have a baby. And that, that, the stillness and the silence there is just, because the captain doesn't know how to, how to respond to that at all, except that he would, he would, where is she? Where is she? I'll, she'll be the sorry girl when I get my hands on her, is what he says. And then when Juno says to Mary, you know, um, she, Mary says, my poor little baby, that'll have no father and Juno says she'll have he'll have what's far better he'll have two mothers yeah um, I, I remember um one night in the gate theater in, in 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 the late 1980s when at the when 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 Geraldine Plunkett said that line the entire house gave her that was a huge round of applause yeah and that happened on a number of occasions, but I remember it specifically in the gate because the gates are very, as you remember, a very respectable audience. There. Yes. But they were going, "Yep, you're right, lady. Yeah. It would be far better than having a father." <laughs> yeah. Um, the, 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 this notion. Sorry, this is a thing flashed up. I have to have a quick look. Oxymoron: Whether Afghanistan, U.S. or Facebook, can you say more about then and have people invoke us by using? by manipulators by using invoking fear it's a bit off topic um however if you want me to expand on that one or joe it let uh, greg send me an email on the same topic and we will get back to you on it um you, you but... see I, I i think there is fear is invoked in the play greg is is, is right it is invoked in the play but it's but it, it by by the mobilizer and the people that come in and and they they would have um just as we're seeing in afghanistan as we saw in iraq i mean where there are these kind of um i like the idea that a civil war is an oxymoron because i think that's that's very true yeah. <laughs> but, but they, they, they by using violence um they were able to on both sides of the civil war in ireland they were able to terrorize a large group of people. Now, in this house alone, Mrs. Mallon's lost her son, Mrs. Tancred's lost her son, now Juno has lost a son. That's three in one house, and these, of course, tenements were, were way overcrowded, and yeah. um, three people. So any other young man in that house would think twice before um, either joining the the... If that would have been an IRA house. It wouldn't have been a, a, a house on the side of the treaty. So, the, the, but they would think twice about supporting the treaty, mm. which is what Tancred did. Um, so that yes, there is there is a, a, a thing in this play where they, they 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 are being manipulated to some extent. But the play doesn't dwell on that because it has so many other things and, and themes that it wants to. Well, to I mean, it do. is why the play is is universal in the sense that. A civil war is a civil war is a civil war, and it means one thing and one thing only. Friends are fighting friends, family is fighting family, neighbors are fighting neighbors. Yeah. And yeah. the ones who have to deal with that so often are the women. Yes. The mothers. Yeah. Um, and that, that was O'Casey's major thesis in this, and indeed in Plow and the Stars, because... Oh, sorry. Same thing last week. <laughs> um, 
Sorry about that. My wife was trying to call me from Dublin, but I will um, call her as soon as we as we finish. <laughs> I'd bother her, but give her my love. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, they, everybody now knows it's definitely live. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, there are no doubt because the number of cock ups I do most weeks is uh, it, it's fine. But anyway, we talk about you know the the vic I mean again the victims that he seemed to understand so well. Mm -hmm. And, and and in play on the stars as well the victims are the women yeah um and there's nora clitheroe is a victim oh uh, uh, maisie madigan uh, not maisie madigan um uh, betty burgess is, is a victim yeah and that 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 i know we're not talking about plow but but that that whole bessie burgess this loyal staunch protestant woman who waves the union jack out her window and you know sings rule britannia when the when they're trying to while the rising is going on who's the only person who saves nora at the end of the play or tries yeah. to save her yeah. is 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 bessie burgess and she dies in the you know that whole thing too because catholic versus protestant is at the heart of what the you know it 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 has been at the heart of what has been um, uh, um, the major political themes in Ireland for for centuries, uh, and and so for O'Casey to bring that onto the stage in in 1926 uh, and say to the new state, because the, the new state had only been um, founded a couple of years previously, say to the new state, um, you know. This is, to all measures, this is going to become a Catholic state as the north of Ireland will become a Protestant state. But if you forget the, the, um, the goodness of individual people, whether they're Protestant or Catholic, you're going to go down a very um, bad road for Ireland. Unfortunately, we went down that road and the Catholic Protestant population declined um, and to less than 5% in the Republic. Um, so he, 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 also he, 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 it's also t t t somewhat forgotten that that you know pr Protestant Ireland, certainly the, 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 the newly formed republic, wasn't an entirely Catholic country, and that there were a vast, relatively vast number of working class Protestants, just as O'Casey was. Yes. Um, but they they declined very rapidly because they declined rapidly because, because there 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 were you know in, in the original straight after the civil war and the when the the um, new government was set up and and they had made Yates a senator and 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 in in that whole period there was a constitution that allowed for divorce and and allowed for pluralism and by 1937. As an entirely sectarian constitution was brought into effect. So yeah. that wasn't a very long time, I mean, between 1924 and, 19, and 1937. And in that period, uh, and also in the Civil War, a lot of the um, Protestant house, big houses were, were ransacked. And so there was very clearly, while, while on, on one level, um, Irish politicians were saying, we want to have a pluralist society, uh, in, in reality, um, once uh, once that new state was founded, um, the, the the Protestant people were were were, were definitely uh, their status reduced until, as I say, uh, many of them moved to the north, many of them moved to to Scotland, um, and and uh, you know, uh, thankfully we've moved beyond in, in in our current state in Ireland. Oh. We've, we've moved way beyond Catholic versus yeah. Protestant. We've moved way beyond um, Catholic Ireland, and yeah. and and it's a very good thing that we have. We've moved away from from Juno, but <laughs> yeah, but but but, 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 but I thought uh, yes, we have, but in a sense, that it, it's part of, I suppose, what O'Casey was predicting, and as you say, O'Casey not wanting to get engaged with the rising, with the egos that were engaged with the rising. Um, I doubt whether he would have had much time for De Valera, since it was De Valera who brought in that new constitution. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he didn't. Uh, I mean, he also, um, you know, a, a, a lot of his later plays, you know, The Bishop's Bonfire and, 
um, and others were very, very seen as as anti-Catholic. I mean, there were there were examinations of how, how Ireland had developed under this kind of more Catholic ethos, yeah. um, and he also um, he he. There was a theatre festival, you remember this. There's a theatre festival in Dublin every year, and the um, Catholic Archbishop of Dublin um, sort of opened it with a blessing. And, and an O'Casey play was, uh, they didn't, wouldn't, couldn't put it on because the Catholic Archbishop didn't want it. So O'Casey banned, put a ban on any of his plays being done in Dublin. And that lasted from uh, mid-1950s until 1964 when he allowed the Abbey to do Plough the Stars and, and um, so that for, for a very long time the Abbey Theatre which had survived so often on O'Casey's work uh, was banned by O'Casey he did not want them doing doing um, his plays because of the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin so yes he had a very strong aversion to the Irish Republic and yeah. he never moved never came back he lived yeah. in in Torquay in Devon, he uh, in the in the in the minutes remaining to us. I mentioned at the beginning that um, apart from the, your your incredible knowledge of Ocasi and 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 his, all his works, um, I think <laughs> excuse me, you probably directed this play more than anybody living. Um, probably, many, we we were talking about it earlier. How many productions you've done of it? Can you can you recall? Well, it depends. Um, I, I've done it. Uh, I, I've done. I started did one of the Abbey. I did one of the Irish Theatre Company. I did it. I did it at the Gate. That production then toured all over the place. I did it in in Washington D.C. and and I did it uh, in Chicago. So uh, I would say about ten times, a round figure, ten times. Have you, ever, have you ever got tired of it? No, 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 never. I, I, I um. I'm sure you're the same. I mean, when when you really love a work, as I do, uh, uh, the, this play, um, every time you do it, you find new things in it because you're working with different actors. I mean, yeah. that's the, the thing. Uh, because the actors bring, particularly with this play, the actors bring so much to the table. Yeah. And when you're working with um, sort of Irish actors about, um, you know, who know they may they themselves would not have lived through uh, the times of that you know the peg were written but their parents or grandparents did so they know and understand what um this play is about and i've had the the great joy i mean of working with brilliant actors on this play when we did the one in the gate we had donald mccann undoubtedly the greatest actor of his generation in Ireland. Yes. So there's no two no question about that yeah. I had John Kavanagh, a magnificent uh, character actor whose jockster um, was regarded by many as definitive. As yeah. a sort of, and uh, Geraldine Plunkett playing Juno, who had a statuesque, uh, just a great uh, steel. And then the joy of Maureen Potter, who was Ireland's oh. greatest comedian. No, the only person in Ireland um, who, put, if you put her name above the title, you knew she was going to fill, uh, and she filled the gaiety every she summer. Was quite, she was quite brilliant as me. Brilliant. brilliant. But I, 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 I had been a big, big fan of Maureen Potter since I was a child because I was taken to the pantomimes every year and then just. Big. And when I said to Michael Colgan, who was the director of the gate, I'd like to ask Maureen Potter um, to, to do. Maisie Madigan, and, and Michael immediately got on the phone, big Michael, he was a fantastic producer, he immediately got on the phone, found, got her phone number, and phoned, while I'm sitting there, he phoned, and, and again, being Michael, he said, I'd like you to play Maisie Madigan. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I've it, been there with him. He, uh, but he was, great, he was a great producer. I was had delighted had you got her, because a, a couple of years later, I did a production of Tartuffe there, and I said, I think the old aunt at the beginning should be Maureen Potter. And he said, oh, but she's a gate actress. And yes. got it. So thank you for that. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I think to have you... that quartet play those roles. Oh, yeah. Um, and then a lot that, that, that had kind of been moiling in my head about, about this play sort of came right in that production. 
book yeah. because I had the actress. And that final moment, which I'm very proud of, of the play, because in, this, in the printed script, Joxer and Captain stay on stage uh, the, alone and the last words, which is almost Beckettian, there's almost, it's almost like uh, Beckett, the way they, they, they speak at the end. But I thought, you know, Joxer's, uh, Joxer's a survivor. Joxer isn't staying here with this deadbeat. This man is finished. Um, so when the captain throws the penny in the air and, and says the last of the Mohicans, and he, it's the last penny he has, what we did in our production was Joxer, drunk and all as he was, made his way over, picked up the penny, pocketed yeah. it, and exited. So we got Ibsen's um, door slam, but now it was Joxer. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for me I'm not coming back here again and slam the door which resounded I was very proud of that moment because and, and I got a lot of uh, I remember a, an Irish critic Gus Smith saying um, in, 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 the, in one of the newspapers um, the purists were offended by this, by this addition to the script nobody was offended nobody was offended <laughs> and, and in fact the, that's what purists are there for to be offended <laughs> to be offended well, if if they 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 get a lot of offence in the work I do, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get I get a little bit of that here as well. But anyway, Joe, listen, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been one. Oh, we've got a question. What's your opinion of changing the setting? I saw a production using Cork accents. Heaven forbid, and Cork place names. I don't think it worked. It's a very much a Dublin play. I think that is well. I don't. I love your opinion, but to, to me. What makes that play what it is is that it is Dublin and therefore universal. But well, as we know, Cork wants to think that it's the capital of Ireland, and true. He, so they, they, of course they try and do it in 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 in, in Cork uh, accents and, uh, and 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 Cork place names. But um, there are some of those words that O'Casey uses that no pure. Cork man ever said. Yeah. No Corkman would have not only never said, but would never say them. Would never say them. So no, I think that it's it's got to be set in Dublin. Anyway, listen, uh, Joe, thank you so much. That's been wonderful. I I hope I can entice you back on to talk a little more more about Irish theatre at a later point. But um, any time, Alan, you know me. I mean, I I I I kind of if there was an Olympic sport in talking about theatre, I'd be there. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Yeah, it's yeah. great. We love it. But anyway, let me jump. Thank you so much. Um, Great. It's been wonderful. Bless you. Wonderful. A few quick words to you all watching next week. Um, we've got another very interesting topic. Uh, I'm going to be joined by our new associate producer, Sharon McCune, uh, talking about uh, Native American theater. And our guest is going to be Randy Reinhold um, from uh, Theater of the Autry. And That'll be next week. It's going to be very interesting. I do, I do hope you join us. Um, we're taking a long look at um, uh, theatre from Native American writers, and um, that's going to be part of uh, something that's going to be happening next season. I have more news about that. Yet again, thanks to the Allegheny Foundation. Any comments, any questions, email us at marketingapigtheatre.org. We would be delighted to read them and to respond to them. Don't forget, make a donation. Every dollar counts. Thank you so much for being with us. See you next week. Bye.